everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is law professor and former general counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives, Stan Brand. Stan, thanks so much for joining me again. My pleasure. Let's summarize where we are right now. So as we know, last week, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments after Donald Trump challenged Colorado's December ruling that he would not appear on the state's 2024 primary ballot under the 14th Amendment. So before we dive into what we heard last week, can you once again explain for us what the 14th Amendment argument is? Yes, it's a post-Civil War amendment as part of the 14th Amendment, which you know, broadly enfranchised former slaves and provided for certain other um, rights for them. And then in lieu of the Civil War, the Congress passed a provision that said that anyone who had previously taken an oath to support the United States and who had engaged in insurrection or rebellion would be barred from serving in a enumerated series of positions uh, and then added yet another provision that said that Congress could remove that disability by a two-thirds vote. So now let's flash forward to where we were last week. The Supreme Court, like I said earlier, heard oral arguments. What are your main takeaways from those arguments? Well, uh, it was a very um, intellectually challenging argument for people who were not um, into the nuances and details of this provision, which uh, was made all the more difficult by the fact that there really is no Supreme Court or even appellate court constructions of this section. Um, and so what I took away after two hours were a couple of key points. One is what I sensed, and I caveat this by saying you can never tell what's going to happen from the oral argument in terms of the ultimate decision because judges use the oral argument to do several things. They use it to parry with each other. They use it to probe the consistency and positions of the advocates. And sometimes they telegraph and sometimes they don't. But what I got from it were a couple of key points. One is I think there was across the ideological spectrum a suspicion that they shouldn't allow one state to determine a, a potential candidate's eligibility under the 14th Amendment because for all practical purposes, a definitive ruling on the 14th Amendment by the court as to Colorado would bind every other state. And so there was this, this theme that kept coming out across the spectrum that this is a national question and it should be something that is um, uniformly applied. That was number one. And number two, they focused on a couple of issues. One was who's an officer under the United States as defined in the 14th Amendment. And that's confusing because there are references to officers under the United States and officers of the United States in different provisions of the Constitution including the Commission's Clause, the Appointments Clause, the Impeachment Clause, and how to mesh these and make them consistent and interpret the 14th Amendment in light of that is really uh, quite an exercise. So that was one focus, is, is, is that. And then the other focus was that former President Trump wouldn't necessarily be uh, adjudicated on whether he was eligible or not until he were actually elected. Because it says, hold, it says holding office, not running for office. And the, um, the Trump lawyers fashioned a pretty interesting argument. And they said, well, because the 14th Amendment provides for Congress to waive the disability, it acts like the qualifications clause for members of Congress. That is, it's not ripe until he's elected and shows up on Inauguration Day. Now, of course, from a practical standpoint, that raises a series of questions about how that would play out if, in fact, he were elected 
and the Congress convened on January 6th to count the Electoral College vote, and there was a dispute over whether he was entitled to be sworn in under the 14th Amendment. But those were the two takeaways that I had. And my guess is that they will take the path of least resistance to decide this case. One, because there's just a plethora of issues that are unresolved that they don't need to resolve to get an answer. And two, I think they want to project some degree of, if not unanimity, overwhelming consensus in the argument that they ultimately endorse. So, so that's what I think the takeaway was from a very exhausting two hours. It was a bit of a grueling two hours, and I do want to dive a little deeper into what you think the future holds here. But I am curious, as an attorney, how would you grade uh, former President Trump's argument versus Colorado's argument? Who do you think had the better argument there? I have to say, I think the advocacy was top drawer. Um, having argued myself in the Supreme Court and been thrust into that crucible, um, to be able to parry and respond and be responsive to the questions and still do justice to your overall theory without shooting yourself in the foot by making a concession or overextending the argument you need to make, I thought they both did an excellent job. Um, and they, they tried to um, stay within the lanes, if you will, of their briefs and their positions in the court below. And that at least, um, I, I'd have to give them both, uh, you know, a, a minus on their advocacy. And let's talk about hypothetical outcomes. First, let's say the Supreme Court does uphold Colorado's ruling. What is this precedent that this sets? What does this mean for other states? I can't imagine a ruling affirming the Colorado decision wouldn't be binding on every other state, even though other states have different procedures and rules that um, apply with respect to eligibility to be on the ballot as a matter of state law. Uh, I can't imagine they would set themselves up for a series of 12 more cases, you know, from Maine and Michigan and Minnesota. Uh, and, and try to deal with that in the context of a, of a time frame between the primaries and the convention and the fall election. So my guess is they will issue, on whatever basis they do, a dispositive ruling that would bind other states. And I know that you called the oral arguments a little dense, two hours listening to them. Is there any indication that you found on how the court will rule? I think, number one, I think what appealed across the board was this notion that you can't allow one state to make this decision, which would tell me it would be reversed on that ground, um, which would put everything back in play to allow Trump to be on the ballot in Colorado. Um, you know, an, affirm, an affirmance of the, um, I mean, the other, the other thing I should say, there was some pretty robust examination. I think it was by Justice Barrett and maybe Justice Gorsuch on whether the Colorado procedure was enough to conclude that President Trump had engaged in an insurrection. That is, what was the um, trial, if you will, that was had sufficient to establish the, the necessary predicates for the amendment, um, given that um, a lot of the reliance was on a congressional report, which is subject to the hearsay rule, which wasn't subject to cross-examination, which wasn't subject to the rules of evidence, um, and a sociology professor who testified about what the meaning of insurrection was at the time of the adoption of the amendment, and, and what quote, due process might be uh, required at, at, a, at a greater level than what was accorded in Colorado in a case like this. So there was some um, discussion of that, although that 
that would require the court to dig much deeper into the issue of who's an insurrectionist and what is engaging in me. And that's, you know, that's going to be a more fact intensive examination, which the court may not be comfortable getting into, given that they have a fully developed record. It may be insufficient as a matter of law, but I don't think they're going to get into a factual finding one way or the other on those, given what the Colorado court found. So, so that's another takeaway for me. As we've stated in previous conversations, we're really in historic, unprecedented times. You're a 14th Amendment expert. What do you think is missing from this conversation? Well, I mean, look, as a litigating attorney, what I look to are judicial constructions that can help me understand uh, what this all means. The only judicial construction there is, is a single circuit judge from 1870, the, the so-called Griffith case, which isn't binding um, because it's one circuit judge. And it, it's, it's not a precedent that too many members of the court were comfortable relying on for that reason. So we are in, in wide open spaces and there's no, uh, you know, there's no guideposts, there's no judicial construction, there's no previous case that sheds any light on this, which I think makes the court's decision that much more difficult because they're writing on what we call a clean slate. And yet, as in Bush v. Gore in 2000, <clears throat> their decision is likely to affect the outcome of the election. Like you're saying, there's no guideposts here. There's no precedent. They're writing on a clean slate. So what are you looking out for next? Again, the narrowest construction of the, the narrowest interpretation of the 14th Amendment that gets them to a place of equilibrium and consensus on the court, and, and which may result in, in the Colorado decision being vacated. Stan Brand, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate your insights. And as this story develops, I hope you come back on again and break it on down for us. I'd love to. Thanks.